Time now for the Educated Retirement Show with your host, Jay Kaplan. Jay discusses reverse mortgages and can answer your questions at 951-922-3532. Call lines are open at 951-922-3532. And now here's Jay. I am bopping up and down as usual with that. Looking at my fat picture on the billboard there. It looks like I have black hair and I did not have black hair when that picture was taken. It seems like when it when it's wet, it seems to reflect what little pigment is in there. Anyway, hey, welcome back to the Educated Retirement Show here on KMET, the mighty Met. As Daryl McCann said, we're blasting from the center of California. Well, I'm not quite sure of that, but uh, we're blasting anyway with the help of uh, Sean, our engineer. So we will uh, get back to some nostalgia here. And uh, whose birthday is today? Uh, yeah, that's today's date. Lester Young, born in uh 1909 and left us in 1959 so not nearly as many years as we would have enjoyed with him lester was an american jazz tenor saxophonist born in woodville mississippi his father was a teacher and band leader so that's that the whole family was musical he grew up in new orleans and worked from the age of five to make money for the fact family selling newspapers and excuse me shining shoes by the time he was 10 he had learned the basics of trumpet violin and drums the young family band toured with carnivals and playing regional sites he and his father clashed and he often left home for long periods so um, let me show you some of the records he's known as Prez in the jazz world and uh, I don't know if we can see through these plastic things. We should probably take the plastic off in the future on the thing. There is one. That's a promotional copy, which is always nice to have. Volume new, two of A Musical Romance. Uh, and uh, here's one without the plastic. Easier to see. Uh, this is on Verve just called Prez, Lester Young and his orchestra, which uh, this was featuring John Lewis, Buddy Rich, Ray Brown, and Gene Ramey. And uh, really a good album. But there's a good picture of them. Although it's a little dark, no, it looks good on screen. And uh, here's another, here's a two for, two for one, Lester Young, volume five, Evening of a Basiite. So actually it's, it's Mm, two records but it, also another promotional copy I got lucky with this with press anyway promotional copies you know are usually some of the very first pressings and uh, there you go and in the inside we've got some decent pictures I'll let you read all of that as it goes by uh, but uh, you'd like to play this when the show is over or soon after uh just another one called Prez. And let me show you some pictures of Prez. How we got that name, I'm not sure. We never found out that, okay? No, I don't know, and so be it. Doesn't matter that much. But here, that's nah, okay. Here's a picture of him with the saxophone and a cigarette. Well, maybe that's one reason he didn't last very long. Uh, here is another picture. Uh, with, oh, this is really nice. That's with Billie Holiday. Uh, I'm not sure who the second saxophone is. The third one, I know him. I just His name escapes me. Oh, man. Doesn't matter. Maybe you know if you look at it. But, of course, there's Billie Holiday. you got three saxophones there. Oh, that must have sounded great. I wonder if I have that. I've got a lot of Billie Holiday. She, Billie Holiday probably was the uh the main person on the the recording but wow what a what a lineup so anyway the young family band uh 
Oh, so Young left the Young Family Band in 1927, became a member of the Bostonians playing the saxophone in 1933. He joined Count Basie and settled in Kansas City and rose to prominence. Over the years, he became part of other groups. He was considered as one of the most influential players on his instrument. He still figured that. And later was known for his hip introverted style and popularized much of the hipster jargon which came to be associated with the music in 1957 he uh, appeared with Billie Holiday Coleman Hawk that's who that second one was I thought it was Coleman Hawkins and boy does he have quite a history too and others in the CBS TV special The Sound of Jazz it was a reunion with Holiday when uh she was phys physically declining and near the end of her career. It was said that <clears throat> Lester got up and played the purest blues in in control room. All were crying. So they were all crying in the control room. His final studio recording in Paris, 1959 and ate next to nothing and drank heavily. <clears throat> and only eight days later passed away. I wonder if that concert in Paris would be on Sam Records, which we spoke about a couple of times. Due to internal bleeding from alcoholism, yikes. Lester Young won the Grammy Hall of Fame Award in 2004 and said he greatly influenced many other saxophone players, including inspired including a direct inspiration on young Charlie Parker, who was leading, who was a leading musical figure in the development of bebop. So we will butt bebop over to reminding you that uh, give us a call at, uh, this is the direct to the station, 951-922-3532. 3532 and of course, uh, you know, our regular uh, phone number, 866-955-2233. Email, call me, do whatever you like, just to uh, rattle my cage and we'll talk. James Wong Howe was born on the 28th, which was tomorrow, in 1899. And he earned his wings in 1976. He was American born. He was an American born, Chinese born cinematographer who worked on over 130 films during the 1930s and 40s. And if you follow film much, I'm sure you've already heard of him. He was one of the most sought after cinematographers in Hollywood due, his, due to his innovative filming techniques. Let me show you a picture of uh, him and a camera okay i think that's that's what you got there oh uh, we have another one here with a big smiley face winning an oscar i believe he won more than one nominated for a whole bunch of them which we will talk about a little bit here and oh i got another one a little older but very serious I mean uh, very influential cinematographer in the history of motion pictures and cinema not to mention very famous he was born in uh, yeah, Guangzhou G-U-A-N-G-Z-H-O-U China and immigrated at the age of five as his father worked on Northern Pacific Railroad they sold Settled in Washington State, where the family owned a general store. He had an early interest in photography as a child, and uh, so did I, but, you know, I didn't get where he did. After his father's death, the teenager, the teenaged Howe, and that's H-O-W-E, moved to Oregon to live with his uncle and briefly considered a career as a bantamweight boxer. He moved to San Francisco Bay Area in hopes of a attending aviation school and ran out, of, ran out of money and moved to Los Angeles. Once there, he took several jobs, including as a commercial photographer, delivery boy, as a busboy at the Beverly Hills Hotel, amongst other things. 
He landed a low-level job at the film at a film lab at the famous players Lasky Studios and connected with director Cecil B. DeMille and eventually became a camera assistant, took publicity stills for Hollywood stars and moved up to director of photography. He maintained the reputation for making actresses look their best through lighting alone without the use of gauze or other diffusion over their lenses to soften the features as other photographers did. And he worked steadily as a cinematographer from 1923 until the end of the silent era. Uh, and then of course, and well beyond, Howe's best known work was almost entirely in black and white, yet he successfully made transition to color and earned the first Academy Award nomination for the color film, The Old Man in the Sea with Spencer Tracy, his second for Paul Newman's HUD. That's the one with the, the eggs, right? Yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, during the late 1960s, he sought, taught cinematography at UCLA's film school, some students being Dean uh, Cundy, C-U-N-D-E-Y, who became the cinematographer for the films Halloween, Romancing the Stone, Back to the Future, Apollo 13, I mean, just a few. Uh, James Wong Howe, the full name, was nominated for 10 Academy Awards and won two for Best Cinematography, one for HUD and the other for the Rose Tattoo. Now here's a short list. Boy, time is going fast on this show. Uh, here is uh, The Thin Man, and uh, oh, this is a radio drama of The Thin Man, so that's always cool. And who played it on the radio? Don't know. Uh, Bruno Lloyd? Brent, no, no, not on this. this. This was a radio thing, so Barbara Luddy, uh, Brayer Morrison, whatever. So anyway, uh, here is the... There's they they had different people on the. Oh, it says okay. You know. Start. Here, yeah, the movie film. Yeah. Anyway, here is one of the most played laser disc sets we ever owned, along with the Honeymooners, which we now have on DVD. Uh, there are the six films: The Thin Man, Shadow of the Thin Man. Uh, Song of the Thin Man, After the Thin Man, Another Thin Man, and Thin Man Goes Home. So, so there. Anyways, the director was uh, W.S. Van Dyke, starred William Powell, Myrna Loy, film nominated for four Oscars, including Best Picture, King's Row. Uh, I have nothing on that, although I do have the music in several places. All right, this is... Uh, when when it comes to a lot of film music especially from the studio here uh they'll have the music of eric wolfgang Korngold, uh and he did the music for uh, king's row now if you listen to the music from king's row boy will you ever hear john williams not that there's anything wrong in borrowing but my god when I first heard uh, King's Row soundtrack, there was the mo there was the music for uh, Star Wars and Superman right there in front of me. So this was directed by Sam Wood, who directed a million other movies. Music by Eric Wolfgang Korngold, uh, starring again Robert Cummings and Sheridan, Claude Rains, and who have you forgotten on that? Our Ronald Reagan, of course, uh, film nominated for three Oscars, including Best Picture, Best Cinematography, The Rose Tattoo, 1955, uh, directed by Daryl uh, Mann, starred Burt Lancaster, film nominated for eight Academy Awards and won three, including Cinematography, Picnic. And this is, uh, here is just the soundtrack with Kim Novak, Rosalind Russell, and of course the mensch is William Holden. So, 
a fun movie more than a serious one to me, but I don't know how you think of it. Okay. I got nominated for six Oscars, including Best Picture, Old Man in the Sea, which I got somewhere, uh, John Sturgis starring Spencer Tracy, nominated for three, Academy Awards won one, HUD 1963, Martin Ritt was the director, Paul Newman, of course, Patricia Neal nominated for seven Academy Awards, won three, including Best Cinematography. Now here's one of the weirdest movies you may want to see. John Frankenheimer did this, and it's just, you can't, somehow can't find it too many seconds. And it has to do with uh, cloning your, anyway, it's it's pretty neat and pretty far out there, especially for the time. But Frankenheimer was kind of like that. Especially for Rock Hudson. Yeah, and Rock Hudson, you wouldn't think of, <laughs> excuse me as I scratch my ear. But anyway, uh, Frankenheimer, was the director starring Rock Hudson, film nominated for an Academy Award for Best Cinematography. So I highly recommend you go look for that. Now, who else was born here on the 20th, oh, actually the 28th, so I'm still waiting for him to be born. I'm in the waiting room, you know. Uh, David Fincher, August 28th, 1962, and of course still with us. David Andrew Leo Fincher is an American film director. Most, his films, most psychological thrillers, I would say a, a little on the strange side that I can't imagine other directors would have gotten away with, received 40 nominations at the Academy Awards, including three for best director. He was born in Denver, which is Colorado. His mother was a mental health nurse so maybe that's where he got some of his stories, uh, who worked in drug addiction programs. His father was an author who worked as a reporter and bureau chief for Life magazine. Wow, I, you know, I didn't realize that until this was, uh, until we looked at this. And he was born two years, when he was two years old, he wasn't two years old when he was born, but at two, the family moved to San Anselmo, California, where George Lucas was one of his neighbors. Okay, boy. Fincher was fascinated with filmmaking at a young age, and when he began making films, well, there's that old 8 millimeter. Oh, it doesn't say Super 8. Cool. So, in his teens, he moved to Ashland, Oregon, where in high school, he directed plays, designed sets, and lighting after school, and became a production assistant at a local television station. And he supported himself by working as a busboy, dishwasher, and fry cook. In the mid-1980s, he became employed as a production head at John Cordy Studio and became a visual effects producer, working with, George, with his old neighbor, George Lucas. David was eventually hired by Industrial Light and Magic as an assistant cameraman, and worked on Return of the Jedi and Indian Jones and the Temple of Doom. After directing commercials, he went on to direct music videos for Rick, Sp Rick Springfield, Paula Abdul, George Mitchell, Michael Jackson, and Madonna. David Fincher has been nominated for three Oscars for Best Director. And here's a short list after I take a swig of coffee, if you don't mind. And a picture. And that's a pretty small picture. And that's fairly lately. And when I saw this picture, that was not at all what I thought a David Fincher would look like. But uh, that there he is. Let me get a, a slightly larger one. Slightly older. But there he is. Oh, he's got black glasses on too. So maybe I'm really, I am in vogue as it would say. Yep, those are my glasses. So, uh, Alien 3 was his first foray into uh, uh, being an actual director. And that starred Sigourney Weaver, Pete uh, Postlewaite, who I really like him, but he died a few a couple of years ago. And Lance Hendrickson, who is still with us, film nominated for one Oscar. I remember we went to see it with friends and those friends, it was, you know, one of those multiplex theaters 
our friends had to leave. They left in the middle and went to the theater next door where a Sister Act 2 was playing. So was it a bit intense? It was. Speaking of intense, he also did seven. Uh, oh, well, I was going to show you. You already seen all these. Alien. Uh, let's see. Is there anything special on the cover of Alien 3 that we might want to look at? Mm, well, not particularly. But as you recall, it was kind of claustrophobic because it was at, all took place at a uh, at a penitentiary in uh, outer space. And wow, there's seven. Seven is very intense. And uh, it's not one that I'm in the mood to watch that often. And if you've seen it, you've understand, you'll understand, but you also would understand, uh, here's an insert from it, uh, why it was as, as well received as it was. Starred Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman, Kevin Spacey, Gwyneth uh, Paltrow, and the film nominee for one Academy Award, The Game, which, oh, here it is. It is. And you got to admit, who else could get away with The Game? I was surprised that the studio even would let them make such a movie. And boy, it was so entertaining. is very, very entertaining if you've seen it. Starred Michael, da uh, Michael Douglas, Sean Penn, Fight Club, which is a great film, 1999. And this is a special little thingy of it. This is a superb film. Very, very, very imaginative. Again, something that only David Fincher, I think, could have pulled off. And uh, boy, it's got all kinds of weird news. But, you know, it's going to fall all over the place. So I'll give it back to our producer, our director. So, like I said, Brad Pitt, Edward Norton, great performances by them. Helena Bonham Carter, who was already used to doing, uh, to being a part of weird films since she is the wife of uh, Tim Burton. She was, yeah. Not anymore? No. Why oh, yeah. not? He got tired of her, she got tired of him. I don't know. Anyway, if you're into <laughs> Tim Burton, the Tim Burton theme of uh, The Haunted House, uh, at Disneyland starts on the third of next month. So the uh, the case of Benjamin Button, 2008, Brad Pitt again, Kate Blanchett, film nominated for 13 Oscars and won three. So there's just a little uh, view of the poster. Again, something that nobody else could. I mean, it, if your name wasn't David Fincher at the time probably wouldn't get permission to do that. Social Network in 2010, uh, starring, uh, Andre Gar starring Andre Garfield. Andrew. Like I said, Andrew Garfield, uh, who was uh, featured last week yeah. in our, uh, our honorable mentions. And one thing I didn't talk about was he's in a film that is not very well accepted, but I'd like it. And if you're a Los Angeles person and you want to see the hype, what the real hype, get under the skin of the real hype of Los Angeles and Hollywood, make sure you see, and it is available on uh, Amazon or whatever, it's free, it would be Under the Silver Lake. Under the Silver Lake. So I, anyway, there you go. The Social Network, uh, Rooney Mara was in it, uh, you know, from the girl uh, with the... Yeah, uh, she was in it. Huh? She was in this. Yeah, well, you, you have her down here as in this, too. Uh, nominated for eight Academy Awards and won three. Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, which I thought was an excellent film. It was more conventional, but, you know, conventional from David Fincher's point of view. But he did a really good job with that. Starring Daniel Craig, Rooney Mara, Christopher Plummer, unfortunately is now gone. And uh, Stellan Starsgard, who I think is a great um, 
I'm not sure whether I, I know he's Scandinavian, but he's really good. Nominated for five Academy Awards and won one. Gone Girl, 2014, starred uh, Ben Affleck, Neil Patrick, Harris. Film nominated for one Oscar. Mank, and Mank is available right now on Netflix. It's really good, and it's in black and white because it reflects the. You know what was going on at the time, and Mank, of course, stands for Mankiewicz. Uh, and if you're into film, you know who that is. So it was only nominated, and this was last year, 2020, only nominated for 10 Academy Awards, and won two. And who else popped out on uh, right about now in 1797? And. Uh, made it to 1851 again not that long but i don't know what life expectancy in those years but a lot of people actually did live longer mary wallen stonecraft goodwin so i understand in those days you took your father's name and your mother's name to be you uh shelly was uh so wallen's craft was her mother's last name goodwin was father's last name and how come her name was shelley because because she married you know the famous poet shelley and she was an english novelist who wrote the popular gothic novel frankenstein which is considered an early exam example of science fiction and we have of course the great current a writer of science fiction that we saw on our four on our 3:30 segment. So it remains widely read and has inspired many theatrical and film adaptations. And here is the only kind of picture we can find. It's a painting, but you know, they were a little short on photography in those days. But that's supposed to be a somewhat decent rendering thereof. Uh, so, uh, I wanted to show this. Frankenstein, of course, you know Frankenstein. I know him. Do you know him? Yeah, there he is. That, that's the original. This is a collection of all the Frankenstein films. Uh, of course, the second one was the best, uh, Bride of Frankenstein, but I enjoy all of The first one was very good. The first sequel was outstanding, and those after were just fun. So, uh, Bride of Frankenstein, if you don't know you, or if you didn't hear it on this show previously, was the first film that ever got an absolute uh, soundtrack for it. Before that, they would use various classical music, this and that. Here is a fairly new album of the music from that. Franz Waxman did it. Again, the very first. Oh, we should show. Yeah, we should show that thing for the turntable. Of, if you want to run and get it, you know that fits on the top. Oh. The spindle. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, just as an aside, uh, music from the film confused, got confused, composed by Thomas Dolby, also another uh, uh, promotional copy only. This was a film done by what's his name uh and of course we've had the whole we've talked about him so much on this show and again uh my memory you know i was born with a bad memory and then it kind of tapered off ken russell of course and this is the perfect kind of avenue for a ken russell very gothic little on the spooky side but pretty cool about her life and uh oh i was going to show this this doesn't exactly fit on my turntable but as you can see you know you put on the top of your turntable to lock in the record uh here's one that is frankenstein himself i wish we could show that other model that's behind the last and uh the bride of frankenstein there she is again it's got the hole in the in the middle to put on your spindle on your turntable i think it's pretty cool 
So Shelley's mother died less than a month after she was born. Her father married when she was four to a woman uh, she had a troubled relationship with. She married poet and philosopher Percy Shelley. And once they found themselves penniless to her surprise, her father refused to have anything to do with her. They left home often to dodge creditors. Mary and Percy spent the summer at their friend Lord Byron's villa, and that's what where, that's where she wrote Frankenstein, and that is the impetus for that uh, Ken Russell film. It was raining as they all sat around a log fire telling German ghost stories, and uh, the discussion turned to the nature principle of the principle nature of the principle of life. Discussion turned. Mary said, perhaps. Uh, a corpse could be reanimated. Reanimated, remember we talked about that last week, which is Lovecraft. Anyway, galvanism, which is what they called it then, had given token uh, of such things. As her imagination started to swirl, she began writing what she assumed would be a short story, which turned into her first novel, Frankenstein, or also called Modern Prometheus and was published in 1818. And another one of her novels was The Last Man, published in 1826, considered the first piece of dystopian fiction published. And of course, there's a lot more to come. As the story goes, in the late 21st century, Europe was ravaged by mysterious pandemic illness mm, that rapidly spread across the entire globe resulting in the near extinction of humanity. So let's hope that doesn't happen. Percy Shelley drowned in his own sailboat at 29. And Mary's last years were devastated by illness, headaches, and bouts of paralysis. And she died at the age of 54. Uh, but remember that you are listening to The Educated Retirement here on your home planet, 1490 KMET Radio, The Mighty Met. And 866-955-2233, 866-955-2233. And one more thing I was going to show you. Didn't like this nearly as much, but this uh, Robert De Niro and Kenneth Branagh, of course, Kenneth directed this, and I thought he was uh, had a pretty good ego, but whatever. Decent, decent film. So that comes later, right? Yeah, I will mention it. Yeah, so, well, that's where we are. Donald O'Connor, what a great dancer. Do you remember him in uh, 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 Singing in the Rain, which we've got several copies of, uh, where he went up the wall and then flipped back over and that kind of thing. And uh, I guess he did that while he was sick. And then they, the uh, the negative was ruined, and he had to do it again. So at least 12 films he was in, most memorable, Singing in the Rain, 1952. Ben Gazzara, 1928. I'm sorry, 1930, and left us in 2012. So an actor of 38 films, director of films, stage and television. So uh, this... Huh? Ben Gazzara was in there. Oh, yeah. We talked about Ben Gazzara, the Spanish prisoner. And, of course, that's a very famous uh, Spanish prisoner. Uh, you know, at least for a while there, it was a pretty famous scam that went worldwide way be well before uh, that film came out. And this is... Uh, on this day. On this day. Gravity was released. Oh, and Gravity was, I don't see that on here, but tough. Yeah. That's the way it goes. That's because it's still in the future. Mary Poppins came out on this day in 64, directed by Robert Stevenson, produced by Walt Disney, starring Julie Andrews, Dick Van Dyke, nominated for 13 Academy Awards and won five. Gravity released at the, best, at the Venice Film Festival in 2013, directed by Alfonso uh, Coran, who did uh, one of the best movies ever done, I think, was 
then we don't have you can, children of man. Children of man. If you haven't seen Children of Man, you got to see Children of Man. Amazing. Uh, starred uh, anyway. Here's Gravity, and uh, they call it a masterpiece. It is a masterpiece of special effects and that kind of thing. Starred Sandra Bullock, George Clooney, Ed Harris, nominated for ten Oscars, won seven, including Best Director, and. Um, his other films, Roma, Children of Men, Harry Potter, and The Prisoner of Azkaban, you know, which I thought was the best of all, all of the Harry Potter films. And did you know that for Gravity, this is kind of, uh, this has a lot of gravity to it, uh, that uh, other people were considered and tried to get the parts, and those would be Robert Downey Jr., and Angela Jolie was, was, you know, the couple. Other actresses tested for the part were Natalie Portman, who would have been good. Naomi Watts, who would have been good. Scarlett Johansson, but she was too busy as the Black Widow. And Rachel Weiss. Weiss. And Alfonso was also inspired by the, he was inspired by the film, 1969 film Marooned, which starred Gregory Peck. Richard Crenna and Gene Hackman. And uh, that is, that kind of ties up our nostalgia mostly for today. We have a few minutes left and I want to add a couple of segments on a regular basis. One that I hope that uh, uh, Let Grandpa Speak will be a good part of. And that's, you know, we always talk about keeping busy. Keeping ourselves busy is a healthy thing to make us live longer. So what are your hobbies or how are you keeping busy? You know, we've we've featured several different avenues to become a, uh, a franchisee of several different companies, including uh, long-term care, in-home care, I should say, and that kind of thing. Now, you know, I keep busy uh, for one thing, doing this radio show, and I get a lot of help, believe me, from our our director. I'm supposed to be the producer, but our director really helps put together a lot of that nostalgia thing and the props that we show on screen. I'm also extremely busy with work, and uh, you know, uh, the loans kind of come at me. I'm not even looking for them because, you know, I've had those health problems, but you know, it's not overpowering me at all. So I'm ready for more, give me a call. But I do work basically full time on reverse mortgages. And that is very, very rewarding. At 75, I wouldn't want to retire. I'm not semi-retired, I'm not retired at all. I work a lot, at least six, seven days a week. And by that, I mean, some of those days are just being available on the phone and the phone rings, I answer it and I talk. So I'm pretty busy usually on Saturdays. Sundays, I try to uh, take some time off, but time off for me does not mean I am not working on certain things. After all, the computer is right there. Uh, The phone is right in my hand or on my belt and I'm ready to go. But Hobbies are another excellent way to uh, to to make you know not only well you don't want to make the time go by faster not at this age not the way it has been going by but to keep busy. Sean, if you're there, do you have any hobbies that you do, or are you too busy with this? I don't do very much. No. <laughs> no, you're pretty busy. You work in, what six days a week anyway. Most of the time, yeah. Yeah, so. But, you know, I do uh, collect records. And I want to show you at least one of the records. You might get the other two that we got. That they, we got three others, didn't we? This is a, uh, a point of pride. Uh, Lee Morgan, the complete live at the Lighthouse. Uh, limited to 2000 and I was so lucky to get one Um, I'm told I have number 446 which doesn't mean a whole lot to me but I'm told a lot of people have had their orders 
canceled because there just aren't enough of these to go around. So I'll show you. There's 12 records here, okay? On, uh, on six double albums. So he played at the Lighthouse for three nights and four sets each one. And all of it is here. And, uh, you know, the Lighthouse is still there in Hermosa Beach. But they don't do jazz anymore, which is a shame because there is... Uh, so much history to it. I would take some of them out and show you some of the pictures, but well, let me do that once. That's okay, isn't it? Okay, so there, there is a booklet, of course. They all have booklets. This is a nice one. Let me show you one of the records. One, let me show you. I'm going to take two of them out. If you could grab that for me, please. Thank you very much. Here is the first one. And just leave that on top. Okay, front, back, and inside. Very nice picture. Let me hold it back. Maybe we can see it, the whole thing. And of course, there's two records in here. Um, and so this would be one set or two sets, I guess. It'd be. And here's record three and four. Uh, front and back and uh, inside is another nice picture uh, this of course at Hermosa Beach it's there and uh, and that's that also this week I got a few other records three other records this one uh, is much older came out on Emerson but it's just a classic. Uh, Steady and Brown, Clifford Brown, Trumpet, Max Roach, Drums, Harold Land, Tenor Saxophone, George Morrow, Bass, Richie Powell, Piano, and that is really wonderful. Uh, the other thing I do is electric trains. And let me just show you. Ooh. Oh, yeah. An engine from the collection. Boy, that's heavy. There you go. Now, let's put that here so it's not as much, not as heavy to pick up. But you know, those are outdoor trains. Oh, here's a couple other records I got. Uh, this is an amazing. This is a real classic. McCoy Tyner, expansions, perhaps his best. But he does so much that's good. And uh, another as if I need another. Uh, but this is another side of John Coltrane where he plays as a sideman on so many other uh, other people's albums. And uh, of course, astronomy is another one. I'd go show you my telescope, but it's a little heavy to bring in. In a little too, it's actually too big for me anymore. So if you're interested in astronomy, it's a 12 inch Schmidt Cassegrain. If you know what that is, a mead, I need some help. So call me, come on over and let's get that thing out. But uh, I'm open for for more jokes. Is that a joke you're coming? Hold on, uh, hold on. Well, I'm going to stand outside. So if anyone asks, I'm outstanding. All right. Well, that was a joke. I was going to say the next thing that I want to have every every show and I want people to call in. And let me tell you, a lot of these jokes came from our guest who looked them up and he sends me every day. Also, he sends me jokes almost every day. And so does Dennis, uh, kind of, a, you know, uh, a good friend. We work on some loans together. He is in the Fresno area. He sends me a joke every day also. And then, you know, so that's, those people could call in, but, you know, they don't. So I, I am putting out an invitation to anyone who wants to call in a quarter to five to five to tell a joke or two or three jokes or just a humorous situation. That would be great. And why don't you tell, tell me that, why don't you come and tell that joke again? 
because it went by awfully fast. Well, I'm going to stand outside, so if anyone asks, I am outstanding. Well, I guess I could be outstanding, too, if I use that. And remember, I've got these jokes I've used so many times. My boss told me to have a good day, so I went home. I must confess, I was born at a very early age. These are Groucho jokes, right? Yeah, yeah. Like I'm not crazy about reality, but it's still the only place to get a decent meal. And this one is great. Nostalgia is not what it used to be. Uh, okay. And of course, living in the lap of luxury isn't bad, except that you never know when luxury is going to stand up. Oh, boy. And of course, Sean's favorite pickle joke. What do you call a frozen pickle hanging from the roof? An ice pickle. Oh, I think we got another one coming from the peanut gallery. Is that true? Don't you hate it when someone answers their questions? I do. Uh, I think you should say that again. A little. Don't you hate it when someone answers their own questions? I do. <laughs> that is that is a good one. You got to admit. And this one is so true. When I was a child, I thought nap time was a punishment. Now, as a grown-up, I should say, as an old guy, it feels like a small holiday. And, uh... You know, I was wondering why the Frisbee kept getting bigger and bigger, but then it hit me. Oh, God. That's... Do that again. That was... That was... <laughs> Do it again. I was wondering why the Frisbee kept getting bigger and bigger, and then it hit me. Oh, man. Uh... Anyway, oh, here's kind of a corny one, but I got over my addiction to chocolate, marshmallows, and nuts. I won't lie, it was like a rocky road. Wow. I uh, failed math so many times at school, I can't even count. Uh, you better say that again, please. <laughs> I failed math so many times at school, I can't even count. Oh, boy. Uh, I went to the toy store and asked the assistant where the Schwarzenegger dolls are, and he replied, I'll be back. I'll be. That's good. The back of I'll be. I'll be back. Let me repeat that. I went to the toy store and asked the assistant where the Schwarzenegger dolls are, and he replied, I'll be back. Uh, you know, some of these, uh, Sean, I haven't read in advance. So if there's something right. naughty, you know, be on guard. Go ahead. I can't believe I got fired from the calendar factory. All I did was take a day off. Oh, God. <laughs> yep. Okay. Bono and the Edge walked into a Dublin bar and the bartender says, oh, no, not you two again. <laughs> All right. Uh, Never trust atoms. They make everything up. They do. And scientists got to, speaking of atoms and science, of course, we like to be on the cutting edge of science and the physics, although the only physics I know well are the physics that I take for an upset stomach. Anyway, scientists got together to study the effects of alcohol on a person's walk, and the result was staggering. No laugh? That was some applause anyway. <laughs> there we go. And uh, I once worked at a cheap pizza shop to get by. I needed the dough. Oh man, is that <laughs> corny or yes. what? So I think we're about ready for that hook to come out and pull me off stage. But before that, let me try one or two quickies. Uh, I lost my girlfriend's audio book, and now I'll never hear the end of it. All right. You got another one there? Yeah. The, um, the easiest time to add insult to injury is when you're signing someone's cast. Oh, man. It took You know, it took me a minute to get that one. But, yeah. A termite walks into the bar and asks, is the bartender here? Okay. Okay. So, a uh, Y is dark spelled with a K and not a C because you can't see in the dark. God, is that corny? Let me repeat that so you can, because you're probably shaking your head. 
How ridiculous that sounds. Anyway, so why is dark spelled with a K and not a C? Ah, oh, because you can't see in the dark. So do you have another one? Be the last one. Um. Because we gotta go. Yeah. We gotta go till next week. But let me tell you. Oh, I got one. Okay. Always borrow money from a pessimist. They'll never expect it back. That is so true. But you know what? Time to go. I really enjoyed it like I always do. Everybody out there, stay safe. We ain't over this stuff yet, but hopefully we will be. Want to thank Sean for what he does all the time. We didn't even have any technical difficulties this time, but he's always there to help. And, you know, I really want to thank him. I want to thank all of the listeners I appreciate you so much. You can't hardly tell. And, you know, stay well, please, until next week. And remember that Kaplan will be here on the same corner in front of the cigar store next week. Thank you so much. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. <laughs>